Great. So uh, today I'm hoping to get into uh, some discussion uh, regarding the material in um, those two lectures uh, that I had recommended as part of the MIT 2019 Applied Category Theory uh, course. Um, lectures which, uh, which expand on some of the ideas we, we talked about last time. Um, now, uh, just as a reminder, I'm, uh, I'm referring here particularly to two of the videos, um, these ones on chapters two, lectures one and two, uh, but um, there's also some, some good material as part of this, uh, this uh, video from uh, the very first uh, meeting of that course in 2019. <clears throat> now, uh, I do have some supplements to the slides uh, that we, um, we talked about last time that I hope will, will expand uh, a little bit your understanding of the material. And while I'm hoping to use uh, some of this time today for the discussion uh, for which I encourage you to bring questions, um, I will cover some material prior to that. And uh, as required, those discussions can go into our, our next office hours uh, hour. Uh, just as a reminder of some <clears throat> important topics within, uh, within these videos, um, we're, we're operating within <clears throat> the broader goal of better understanding profunctors. And uh, profunctors, um, we've talked about as, as providing this this way of, of reasoning about making a B from an A or, or turning an A into a B, um, or alternatively as ways of getting from an A to a B. Um, and uh, Bartosz has, has analogized them to proof relevant relations. Now, um, in order to uh, better understand the uh, value of profunctors uh, in programming, but especially in modeling, um, uh, we're going into some material uh, today and, and last time, which um, will soon sort of reconnect with, with profunctors. Um, and it has to do with uh, building up our notion of uh, what it means to, to be a category. Um, so within this context, uh, we start to talk about uh, monoids. Um, and remind you of some, some features of monoids, these structures that capture uh, binary combination, um, uh, have a unit element, which when combined with any other element gives that other element. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, they'll, they'll be capturing notions of parallel, um, uh, parallelism within the context of wiring diagrams. We also talked about pre-orders as kind of the most basic structure that captures ordering uh, of one sort or another, um, where there's many types of pre-orders that define that ordering in different ways, as one thing being, uh, being numerically less than another, or one set being included in another, uh, or one subtype being a subtype of another, uh, et cetera. Um, we saw it with partitions, and uh, we see it's actually a quite, a quite general notion. And pre-orders have this notion of join and meet as key operations, which uh, are particular examples we've seen in the context of, uh, of products and co-products, uh, with meet being analogized to product in a pre-order context and join uh, joined to co-product. Um, now, uh, combining the two of them, we talked about this notion of a monoidal pre-order, um, and it captures features of both ordering and, uh, and of, um, and of com combination of elements, but in a way that, that is not merely reducible to each in isolation. So there's this notion of monotonic uh, combination that the, um, the combination that we see in monoids, binary um, combining things in a binary fashion, 
uh, that combination ends up uh, also uh, needing to be monotonic, meaning that if we, um, if we combine uh, A and B um, that are um, each less than, uh, just try to get rid of this venue here, um, C and D uh, correspondingly or respectively, then uh, A uh, combination with B is uh, less than B combination, or excuse me, than C combination with D. Uh, awkwardly said, but we'll come back to it. Now, um, this work took a somewhat different turn in talking about wiring diagrams, uh, which are a close variant on string diagrams. And, and these are visual ways to characterize operations on these uh, quantities that we commonly deal with symbolically. So whether it's a preorder or a monoid or a monoidal preorder, and indeed their generalization in V categories, we can we can often use wiring diagrams to visually realize uh, reason about these things. And it turns out that once one reaches a certain level of richness uh, with monoidal preorders and particularly symmetric monoidal preorders, um, it turns out that a lot of um, what the ways in which we reason visually about a diagram, um, correspond directly to these axioms or these rules, these laws associated with uh, these symbolic structures. So uh, when we have a symbolic structure that is in the form of a symmetric monoidal preorder, all these things that seem totally natural in terms of a diagram, that it just should be this certain way, such as not needing to worry about um, uh, when we see things in a row, how the, there are parentheses around them without needing to worry about anything like that. We'll see that um, those are exactly built into the structure of a symmetric monoidal preorder. The ability to flip or cross wires, um, the ability to, to reason about um, uh, in, taking, taking the things that are in parallel in either groupings and not worrying about kind of which pairs they come in, et cetera. And we'll see this even more so next time with symmetric monoidal categories, where we have this incredibly powerful way of kind of understanding wiring diagrams in two different fashions. Uh, that's reflective of the fact that, that we go to the categorical level and we functorialize, we turn into a functor things which are otherwise were just functions. In other words, they can be applied to morphisms and therefore, and they honor, um, they honor composition. Uh, now, further than that, there are these axioms associated with these structures, um, particularly symmetric monoidal preorders that directly shape kind of the, the laws of, or what we can do in the semantics of wiring diagrams. And part of what was in these videos um, was this reasoning about axioms like the discard axiom or an axiom uh, associated with, with symmetry or an axiom associated with copying duplication. And it turns out if we have those axioms, we could sort of capture them in these wiring diagrams um, directly. Uh, and really what this turns out to indicate is that wiring diagrams serve as this kind of alternative way of expressing and typically a more natural way of expressing what can be written down symbolically. Um, and more than that, our, our visual reasoning starts to be involved in ways that stay true to uh, the, underlying, um, the underlying structures. Uh, there's something very powerful here and something that's not merely using the diagrams to sort of um, as a epiphenomenal presentation of it, but as something that genuinely can be a representation. And this is gonna follow us into our discussion of dynamical systems as well. Uh, now, it should be noted that these wiring diagrams are different 
they have different rules and semantics, as you might expect, if they have this correspondence with the underlying structures, they're different for different underlying structures, say for a preorder, for a monoid or a monoidal preorder, what the wires mean, what the uh, elements mean, and particularly when we're dealing with symmetric monoidal categories where, where they'll sort of burst into full form uh, next time. Uh, now, also in these lectures, these very material packed lectures, is this notion of a V category. And um, uh, you can be excused for thinking about this as an extension of a category. Uh, and indeed, there's this term in category theory, enriched categories. Uh, but uh, the authors here, or the, the uh, presenters, uh, David Spivak and Brendan Fong, uh, argue that this is a bit of a misnomer. And so-called enriched categories um, are, are actually um, um, not, not to be thought of as kind of adding things onto a normal category. Rather, they're thought to be of as, as every bit as natural uh, as, as regular categories, just kind of a change of basis from a regular category. Um, a, um, an alternative way of using categorical structure that's just as first class, just as privileged as a typical category. And a typical category uh, has some, um, some structure that uh, is a little bit more complex sometimes to understand than say a bool category. And so they, they see fit to kind of reason first about bool categories as, as V categories. And far from being enriched, they're kind of simpler Simpler, simpler than, than traditional categories. And um, as it turns out in V categories, we have this HOM functor associated with it um, that maps elements, uh, that maps um, uh, any two, a pair of two elements, uh, A and B, in, instead of just being two, uh, always a set, a set of morphisms between them, it can be to a V, and that could be um, a symmetric monoidal preorder. Uh, it could be a Boolean. It could be a set, or it could be a, a, an element of cost, a cost um, monoidal preorder that um, characterizes costs and that recognizing higher costs are worse than, than lower costs. Um, so we have this generalization of, of, of a HOM functor uh, for V categories, where it, it maps not only to, to sets in some fixed way, but to these other things as well. Boole would indicate, is there a link between these two, as you might recall from, from prior categories. And this is, in fact, a V pro functor, which is our main quarry for next time. And uh, much of the motivation for this material lies in this ability to reason about V pro functors as mapping between V categories. And that will open up this amazing explosion of, of possibilities of what we can characterize using these categories. An explosion that will be hinted at in, in some of the material within these lectures and in my um, slides from today. Okay, so just as a reminder, um, we had talked about uh, monoidal, or excuse me, pre-orders last time, as well as monoids. Um, monoids bring combinations such as with a tensor, with an identity element. Uh, pre-orders bring ordering, and you combine both, and you get this whole greater than the sum of the parts. You have a pre-order, this is these elements. We're not dealing with a category yet here. These are just elements in some set. We have a pre-order. Any two pair of elements um, have a, um, uh, can have a relation between them. Um, and, uh, and then there's a binary function, a combination, which maps any two elements of P into uh, another, another element of P. 
So this might be plus, or th this might be times, or this might be um, might be something like a um, uh, a uh, minus. Uh, excuse me, minus is not associative, um, but uh, could be a string append or what have you. Uh, and it satisfies the following conditions. This is this is important. Not only do we have these, but we have these conditions, and these conditions actually end up um, taking some features of each of these. So we have associativity for monoids. Uh, we don't have to worry where the parentheses are. If we combine A, B, and C, for example, and it could be extended to D, E, uh, to D, F, et cetera. We have unitality. So combining um, any element from P with, with E, the, the unit element, um, uh, we'll, we'll just give that element back. And I don't know why I didn't uh, put in a key, key component here. Um, so it'll just give that element back. Uh, and critically though, these are just from monoids, but critically there's this way which these two play together nicely, they interact. And that's the monotonicity of this combination. Not only do we have the ability to combine things that in a way that obeys the rules of a monoid, not only do we have a pre-order, but they play together nicely in the sense that, look, if A is less than or equal to C and B is less than or equal to D, then A combined with B has to be less than or equal to C combined with D. In other words, this is monotonic. Um, and uh, that, means that these two are not solitudes to each other. They, they combine together neatly. And there's many types of these monoidal preorders, and we saw a bunch last time. Um, uh, in all cases, this combination has to be a thing which, uh, when combined with the, um, the unit element, uh, will give, uh, you combine the unit element with anything else, it will give that other thing else. So uh, true combined with uh, true is true, true combined with false is false, true combined uh, and, and, and hence it serves as unit. Um, and zero will serve as that unit for the natural numbers or for the real numbers with plus or for the naturals, uh, one will serve that with times. You multiply one by any other natural number, you'll get that other number back. Um, and, and yet there's many things outside the, the sort of strictly numeric areas uh, and Booleans. We might have benefits, for example, extending between zero and, and infinity, where we have this notion, a similar notion of, of combining and, and less than or equal to. But we might have cost. And for cost, we might prefer things that are smaller. So we flip this ordering. Um, and as it turns out, while uh, an integer, um, default integer pre-order, the smaller number will point to the larger, meaning five is less than six. For cost, five will be considered better than six. Um, it'll be considered greater, it'll be considered sort of more favorable than six, as it were. Um, and, and so this comparison of, of one thing to another is flipped here. So this is, is uh, preferred to six, which is preferred to seven as a matter of cost. Uh, and it reflects the fact that lower cost is better than a, than a higher cost. Um, now we're going to see within uh, some examples power set of x. So, so here we have um, a different subsets of x. Uh, our asking if one is less than another is based if one is a subset proper or otherwise um, need not be proper um, uh, of the other. Uh, x itself is the is the identity element uh, every everything and and it's because intersection whoa is the combination anything intersected with x itself any 
any subset of X intersected with X will be that other subset of X, uh, et cetera. Now, you'll notice that for some of these, the, co the combination here is, is actually uh, a familiar thing from, from the ordering relation, or from a pre-order, like meet or join, et cetera. And uh, for something like partitions, for example, uh, we might have the join uh, be, uh, be the element by which we combine two things. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this bottom one is when combined with any other element, it ends up um, uh, being uh, using this, uh, this join operation just be, uh, being the other thing. So we might have an agglomeration, for example, that takes any two of these. This is what the, the join is here. We take any two and we combine anything that is combined in either one. So C and R are combined children or reproductive age people or, or reproductive age people and older people here. And so the join of them is, is this here. Um, and uh, this would be the meat of them down here. This is the join of them. And for our case, for the case of this monoidal preorder, um, this serves as the unit element. You combine it with anything else, you get that other thing back because we're agglomerating from anything that's combined in any of the earthies and nothing is combined here. Um, so it doesn't add any constraints for combination from what's in the other, the other element. So these are all monoidal uh, pre-orders. Um, okay. Um, now I, I will just note that um, when we have a, a combination of, um, of elements uh, such as we'll see in uh, a categorification to this um, uh, here. Um, uh, actually, it's, excuse me, it's not here, but we'll see a categorification. I'll just note that uh, when we have a product category uh, and we have an object that's the product of two other objects, let's say B and B, and another object, product, uh, uh, the um, product of two other ob or two objects, say C and A, there's a link between them only if there's a link pairwise between each of the subcomponents, C to B here and say A to B. Um, only in that case is there a link between these two. And uh, so it will be when we're dealing with uh, a categorification here, where we're dealing with, with product categories. There'll be a link between these two, only if there's a link between these two here. Um, if A is less than C and B is less than D, it's the same basic reflection. So when we go to categorify this and this product here, this, this tensor product comes from a product category mapped into uh, the basic category, uh, uh, in other words, a bifunctor, then, then this will just reflect this basic truth that we only have a link if there's a link between each of its uh, pairs of elements. Okay, um, right. Now, um, it's very common to add symmetry in to monoidal preorders. And uh, a, a given monoidal preorder is a symmetric monoidal preorder. We saw monoidal preorders here, but it's a symmetric monoidal preorder if we further have this additional symmetry axiom here that uh, A cross B is less than or equal to B cross A, okay? And that will make it symmetric. Now, uh, if we have a symmetric monoidal preorder, um, then we'll have a, um, uh, we can have the, the following uh, elements here with symmetry included. 
And this is actually a strict version of it, meaning these two are equal. So we have symmetry actually further saying that these two are equal, not merely isomorphic, and not merely one is less than or equal to another. So here with symmetry, we have this symmetry axiom that's been added to what we had here. We had associativity, unitality, and monotonicity. In other words, it's associative, it's unital. If you combine it with any other unit, you get the other thing back and it's monotonic. But now we have this uh, symmetry as well. Um, okay, now, um, as I said, there's, um, for each of these types of structures, pre-orders, um, uh, the context of monoids, the context of monoidal preorders, uh, we have these um, notions of a wiring diagram. And each of the wiring diagrams is a little bit different. And Brendan Fong does a nice job sort of mapping that out in uh, chapter four, um, part two uh, that, that he presents and that we'll be viewing for later in the week. Um, now, and a really important thing that I think uh, could be further stressed from what was seen in these videos is the fact that um, the wiring diagrams that are used have this semantics and they have a reasoning made possible about them that directly maps to the rules of the underlying structures. So, um, Let's take this example of a uh, of, of preorders. So here we have reflexivity and transitivity. Uh, reflexivity is saying, look, for everything of the preorder, A is less than or equal to A. Uh, transitivity says that we have something A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to C. Then A is less than or equal to C. Um, it's transitive, and you could see this as an aspect of composition. And uh, that's nice, um, a nice feature. Uh, and when we have a, sym a symmetric monoidal category, we're kind of layering on these additional features of monotonicity, unitality, associativity, and symmetry. But uh, let's let's see how each of those is reflected in a wiring diagram. Reflexivity is basically saying, look, if you have this in a wiring diagram, um, there's no need to do that. You could just replace it by a single wire. If you have two wires here coming out of either side of something that simply asserts they're less than or equal to, that's kind of a no-op. It's kind of a nullary operation. We could just replace it by a, a simple wire. Um, for transitivity, if we have x less than or equal to y and y less than or equal to z, then we can put them together in this sort of form, um, which is thoughtful and, and kind of nice. Um, I didn't have to draw the ordering here, by the way. I probably should have gotten rid of those, those arrows but we can join them together, string them in series without worrying that we've somehow changed the semantics. And that kind of makes sense. We kind of want to plug visually this Y into that Y. And this is supported by, permitted by exactly this axiom here. Um, we put these together, we put them together visually, we get this, and this is implying that X is less than or equal to Z. Uh, in total. Okay. Um, so all I've done is, is replaced A by X, uh, B by Y, and C by, by Z here. Um, okay. Um, those were features of, um, of a preorder. Let's go on to the features of a symmetric monoidal structure, which defines a symmetric monoidal preorder. Symmetric monoidal preorder is a is a preorder equipped with uh, uh, with this this sort of structure. Okay, so monotonicity is telling us, look, if we have something like this, um, we can stick them together. Excuse me, like this. So 
if we have a1 less than or equal to b1 and a2 less than or equal to b2, we have a1 times or tensor product with a2 being less than or equal to b1 tensor product with b2. And that's kind of exactly what our, there's part of, if, if we visually know that parallel placement here means tensor product, we kind of want to say, well, this, we can see this as feeding in here, but why can't we view this as A1 tensor A2 and B1 tensor B2 here? Um, rather than viewing each of these as separate. And indeed, it's saying these two are interchangeable. Um, this is true exactly when this is true. We could sort of split this box through the center and get this, or we could take this and agglomerate into this box. Visually, we kind of want to believe they're the same thing. And symbolically, they are the same thing because of the rules of a symmetric monoidal preorder. Um, with there's something like this, but more powerful yet, it's going to come with symmetric monoidal categories that we'll see next time um, th that builds on the uh, composition property uh, and the functoriality of, um, of the mapping uh, of, of C cross C into C. Um, but unitality is another feature. If we have something like this, we have this unital element. I call that uh, I here following David Spivak. Um, you could say, well, wait, why can't we just call it uh, mumble? Uh, oh, okay. I'd have to go back further slides. Why can't we call it E? Well, you could call it E. I called it I following David for minimal confusion. We have this element that serves as monoidal product. We're multiplying it by something gives the other thing, always gives the other thing. So if we have this, we sort of, we, we, or we have a blank space here, it's the same thing and we just treat it like this, which in this case is just equivalent to the, just to the wire. So this is kind of the ether. This is the thing which when you combine it with anything else yields uh, that other thing. Um, so this is like having no wire, which is just like having, don't even worry about the white space, saying don't worry about white space and don't worry about accommodation here. Associativity is saying kind of, look, if, if you have this, whoa, sorry. If you have this or you have this, it doesn't matter this kind of grouping. They're all the same. They're all the same as just having A, B, and C in here. We don't have to worry about what goes with what pairwise. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter um, in terms of that. So associativity is allowing us to, to not have to worry about sort of the particulars of when we, we introduce each of these in in some, in some pairwise fashion. And yet when we write it down, it kind of looks pairwise. And you know, even if we drop the parens, we're putting them in a certain order. Um, and visually, it's kind of nicer to reason about it here. Finally, symmetry can be denoted with this, uh, that wires can kind of go by and bypass each other uh, without, without really touching. So we can swap A and B and B and A interchangeably and it doesn't hurt it. It's a wiring diagram. We just kind of route them, route them around. And then if we want to generalize these diagrams, we can add in these things like the discard axiom, um, which is unhelpfully shown under my, my thing, uh, my, my image here. So um, here, the discard axiom, is basically uh, allowing us to say, look, uh, if you have on the right-hand side, this ether element, or basically it's saying, um, this should actually be E uh, here, or I rather, 
I should really make it obvious that it's an I. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll put it like this, just for consistency with what we had here, this element I, when we combine it with anything else, we get the same thing back. Uh, because we could combine this with anything else, it kind of doesn't matter so much whether or not we represent it, whether or not it's present or absent doesn't really matter. Um, and by saying something is less than it, allows us to take something, put A on the left and I on the right uh, at any point, and we can sort of then drop I from then on because having I present and combining is the same as not having it at all. So it's like it, it vanishes. Um, so it's kind of like having something which goes here and then disappears. A copy axiom here, uh, by contrast, um, allows us to duplicate things. Uh, here, we could have A coming in. I should really have a little uh, something shown of this, but we have A coming in. We could have two A's going out. Uh, and that allows us to kind of duplicate our A's and use them, use them around uh, A. And uh, for symmetry, we can swap things um, like this swap them around in a way that allows us to, to kind of not worry visually where they are on the page. We don't have to worry about crossing things. Uh, and, uh, and as David Spivak notes and Brendan kind of notes parenthetically, I think as well, um, the whole, a whole diagram here can be seen as kind of um, building up um, a, a sort of statement about a whole based on statement about statements about the parts. This becomes quite important for reasoning about wiring di diagrams in the dynamical systems context. We're not yet at those type of wiring diagrams. We're still dealing with those where these boxes are less than or equal to. But next time for symmetric minoidal categories, we'll break out of this and we'll have boxes of all different sorts arbitrary morphisms. Here though, uh, we have uh, these hypotheses you could think of them as um, involving the internal parts. So this is saying, for example, B cross C, um, B tensor C here is less than or equal to D tensor Z. Uh, and it's moreover asserting that A tensor D uh, is less than or equal to X tensor Y. And if you accept, sorry, if you accept that is true and that is true, then it follows that A tensor B tensor C is less than or equal to X tensor Y tensor Z. And, you know, the, the really powerful thing is here we're abstracting away for what is from what is less than or equal to mean for us? What does tensor mean? It could mean any of these thing, types of things shown earlier, shown here, for example. Um, you know, tensor could mean plus, it could mean times, it could mean uh, Boolean and, it could mean intersection, it could mean max, it can mean min, it can mean agglomerate in a pre-order, in a partition context. It could mean any of those things. Um, and, and yet that formula would hold. Less than or equal to could mean, you know, is this less than or equal to in a partition sense? Is, is one partition uh, kind of uh, an approximation to another as a one partitioning an approximation to another? Um, does it mean less than or equal to in a numeric context? Does it mean in sort of a, a subset of, does it mean greater than here? Does it mean logical implies? Any of those are, are equally well communicated by this and by a diagram such as this. So wiring diagrams allow us this kind of tremendous uh, compose, this tremendous ability to have this uh, reasoning about symmetric monoidal pre-orders for this unbounded number of symmetric, possible symmetric monoidal pre-orders. 
and symmetric monoidal preorders are an extremely important class of structure we see over and over again, as indicated by that list earlier. And this allows us to kind of reason about them in this hierarchical fashion. If we accept what's being said by the components, we can accept what's being said by the outer, outer box. In other words, this provides us a way of kind of proving these characteristics from the inner to the outer as kind of visual proofs, as it were, in a way that's very natural. Uh, okay, so um, all this, perhaps it shouldn't surprise you, can be categorified. And for a symmetric monoidal tree order, one of these things we've been dealing with, we can take it and define a, a so-called V category. We call this symmetric monoidal category, this fancy V, script V. And we could say there's a V category and it has objects, which are the objects, which are the elements of V. I should really say elements of V. Um, uh, elements of V, great. Um, and then it has this kind of Palm structure where any of the objects in it themselves derive from from um, so really this should be p. It's elements of v are equal to p. I mean they're they're just the the elements of p. Okay, um, and then there's this uh, this Palm type structure where you take any of those objects, um, any pair of those objects, and we map it to uh, a, a P, um, excuse me. Um, so uh, here, um, uh, I, I misspeak here, excuse me, excuse me. I'm, I am incorrect about this. It has a set X of objects. I, I said they were P, no, 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 ignore that, ignore that. Um, it's a set X of objects. Um, and, uh, and then for any pair of those objects, we have a value drawn from P um, for that. So this P might be, for example, mention a cost. And so for any pair of objects, we have a, a cost uh, that indicates the cost of going from the first to the second. Or maybe it's a Boolean that says, can you get from the first to the, sec to the second? Or maybe it's a set that says the ways you can get from the first to the second. Um, but in any case, it, instead of having just a set, as is the case in a category, we have this, uh, we have this function. And it's subject to the following conditions that you may, you may recall from, from categories identity um, and uh, what's notable here is that uh, the identity morphism um, here as it were is an element drawn from p and it has to be less than or, or greater than or equal to e this this identity element here or this unit element i should say of the monoid and composition here uh, is of this form which seems kind of familiar from the categorical context um, where it's the, in the categorical context it said for every uh, for every morphism x to y and every morphism y to z there's there exists a composition of those mor morphisms from x to z uh, and here it's kind of similar um, but we're defining it with this composition of this symmetric monoidal preorder and so maybe this is plus on cost, in which case we get the cost uh, to go from X to Y plus the cost from Y to Z has to be less than or equal to cost from X to Z. This is kind of like the triangle equality. Or maybe um, V is bool, in which case this um, composition is, you know, if, if there is a link between, if you can get from X to Y, and you can get from Y to Z, then you're guaranteed to get, be able to get, because this is greater than or equal to true, from X to Z. Uh, so V categories um, 
have all these uh, particular cases. Uh, Boole set it with with different semantics uh, uh, and uh, associated with a uh, cost, for example. Um, so every pre-order is associated with a bool category. Uh, objects are, in this case, are elements of P. And for objects X and Y, um, it's true if X is less than Y and P false otherwise. And, uh, and we can represent it as a square matrix. So we have something like this. This is a, this is a pre-order illustrated. And this is a table associated with the, uh, the ordering relationship that could be used to define uh, this, uh, uh, this, this component of the mapping. So we can just read out from that table, which maps element here, elements here, and it tells whether one of them is less than or equal to the other. We can just read out what this function is. Um, and in general, it's saying that CXX for bools has to equal true. Uh, and that again, if there is a link from X to Y and a link from Y to Z, then there is a link from X to Z. Uh, Pre-orders are these bool categories. Um, a cost category is a set X and a function from X to X that's kind of a distance function or a cost function that maps this to zero to infinity. Um, so a cost category is associated with these costs between these two. And the cost from X to X in general is gonna be greater than or equal to zero. And we have this, uh, uh, we have this uh, sort of triangle equality like um, assertion here. Um, and you can again create a category where you illustrate, this would be a presentation, where you illustrate these costs on its, its lengths. This is a cost category. So we label these lengths between any pair of objects. If there is a length of cost greater than uh, infinity, we label it with that cost. So MIT to Boston Common is labeled with five here, for example, and you could see it in this table. Um, or the Barrack Boston Aquarium to this uh, fish, um, somewhat symbolic rendered, uh, is associated with eight here. Um, there are some that are not connected directly. So for example, uh, the aquarium directly to BC, uh, to the Boston Common, you can't get to directly. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, that should be, okay. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so the aquarium, I, th I, I think it's in, let's see. Uh, so MIT to British, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the Boston Common is this one. Yeah, so this should be actually infinity here uh, because you can't get directly to the, um, uh, to this. So that should be infinity. And MIT, you can't get directly. Oh, uh, that, that looks odd. Um, okay. Oh, I see. Uh, I think I'm reading it the wrong way. Yes, Wade. I'm wondering if aquarium to Boston Common mm -hmm. is eight because it's three plus five via MIT. Yeah, except he had two versions of this. One where he tried to make it only a single step and one where he tried to make it a, a, a multiple steps. This is the multiple step one. And I think he forgot to change this to infinity. You notice he, subs he actually drew this first and then he substituted in because like in this one, you can go from MIT to the aquarium. Um, yeah, this... This isn't making sense. Like why he'd he'd change that to um, to be uh, infinity. Um, okay. In any case, uh, there there exists a version of this where uh, you you basically have infinity if there is no link. Otherwise, um, you label it. Just like 
you don't draw a link here um, if there if there is none. For example, peach to strawberry does not show a link because there is none. What makes this a little bit confusing is there is a link from uh, by by transitivity from banana to mango here. It's indicated in the table, but it's not explicitly drawn. Um, okay. Um, but the, the general point is when we have something like this V category, every pair of objects has a label from uh, that, that's associated with it. And this label is drawn from this, um, this value P. Uh, you could see it here. This is a labeling for any, any pair. And that's what we draw here. This label is a bool here, and we only draw it if it's true. This label is a cost here, um, MIT to Boston Common, a cost of five, so it's drawn. Um, if it's infinity in general, it wouldn't be drawn. For example, Boston Common to MIT is not drawn here. Um, uh, and, in, and with set, so those were cost, bool. With set, um, we might have something like this, where we have these, um, uh, these elements X of the category. Um, and then we have a set, uh, which, which labels them which might be how you can get from one to the other. And there might be many particular ways, for example. So for example, from Saskatoon to Vancouver via train, automobile, or aircraft, um, or from uh, Vancouver to Sydney by aircraft or boat. And here uh, we have a intersection associated with meat which if we applied it would help us recognize that we can only get from Saskatoon to Sydney, Australia. If we only want to confine our, if we only want to use one mode of transportation, it would have to be aircraft. If we took the intersection of this set and this set, we'd find the only member that's on the intersection is aircraft. Um, uh, and whereas if we went from Vancouver to Sydney or Seattle to Sydney, we could do so, for example, with aircraft or boat, um, either, either one. Um, and, uh, and that would provide a, um, uh, an avenue from, to go from end to end. So a category like this can be used to reason about end to end um, uh, connectivity. And in fact, uh, one thing we won't talk about, we haven't talked about here, and that really was only alluded to briefly in the lectures, in the videos, was the fact that if we encode this information, and if, and if we encode it in a matrix form, uh, we can, through a certain kind of version of matrix multiplication, we can go from only direct relations where we're just uh, recording, for example, the link of Saskatoon to Vancouver, the Saskatoon to Seattle, uh, Seattle to Honolulu, et cetera. We can, we could create a table and then through a certain notion of matrix multiplication, uh, a generalization of matrix multiplication, we could get a composite relation, which would tell us the only way, for example, to get from Saskatoon to Sydney is via aircraft. Um, if, if, if we only want to use one mode of transportation, or the cost of getting from uh, from uh, the Boston Common, for example, to MIT, which would require a composite um, travel here, uh, we can we can do it, and and it would end up here uh, involving um, uh, the addition of these paths, but taking the least cost path to it. And that would all fall out. For Booleans, it would let us derive whether there's an indirect path from one to the other. So anyway, um, those were some uh, major themes coming out of this. 
Um, and uh, I wanted to bring out some of those additional components we didn't have time to go into last time. Um, I'd like to open it up now for some discussion and particularly here during question period, see if we can get, uh, get some good discussion going. I would note that, uh, uh, you know, we could dwell more on this material for next time. There's certainly a lot to digest here or we could uh, push on to chapter four. And I'm looking for a bit of guidance whether we should go on to this for Wednesday or maybe reserve Wednesday to discuss this material in more depth um, and, and then go on to this material, including that matrix combination and the issue of uh, V pro functors um, uh, for, for next time. So what do people think? I'll, I'll stop my recording.